Hi everyone, welcome to the Kids Cast. Today we are joined by some of our change makers on the project. Uh, I'm Dean, I use he him pronouns. Uh, and on today's episode, we're basically going to be talking about, um, you know, our change makers' journeys, uh, what motivated them to get involved, and what they care about, what they're passionate about. Um, so I'll pass around to, to some of the team to introduce, introduce themselves. Hi everyone, I'm Grace, one of the peer researchers, and I use she her pronouns. Hi, I'm Andrea and I'm another peer researcher and I use she, her pronouns. I should, I should probably say I'm a peer researcher as well. So I'll just hand over to our change makers who are going to introduce themselves as well. Hi, I'm Maggie and I'm a change maker. Hi, I'm Charlie and I'm a change maker. Brilliant. So today we are going to be, like I say, um, talking about some issues that matter to our change makers uh, and kind of, suppose we should start off by saying what made you get involved with PAC and, um, you know, what kind of has motivated you to keep going forward as change makers. So I'll, I'll go to you, Charlie, first. Okay. Um, what motivated me was because I like to get involved in activism. Hmm. And so I had an email saying that I could come along. So I said, okay, I'll come along, give it a try. And how do you think it's helped you kind of personally or, you know, do you think it's gave you any skills that you think you'd like to go forward with maybe? Um, I've got like more confidence by like going to these events and things so like in the future I can be like a better public speaker. Definitely. So Maggie, what would you say? What's, what's kind of been your journey into PAC as a change maker? So I got involved through my sister and... Um, Who's here today. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So I suppose um, what what makes you care so much about, obviously, PAC's all about youth violence um, and, you know, we're in Merseyside, so it's specifically about um, making a difference in our communities. So what kind of motivated you to do that? Because I want to try and make a change because the area I live in, I see a lot of youth violence, which is very scary and upsetting. Brilliant. So, um, so that's obviously our change makers perspectives on what made them get involved. I'm going to hand over to Grace because, um, you know, you, you can tell us a little bit about why working with change makers is so important and why we felt it's such a vital part of PAC and the, our project. Yeah, I'll give a little bit of context into what PAC is. First of all, so PAC stands for the Peer Action Collective. It is a national project going on a going on in 10 different areas across England and Wales. We're covering the Merseyside region. And for us, we've interviewed 515 mm. young people over that time. And some of our change makers have been interviewed by us and we gave them the option later down the line, if you want to get involved in social action. And they got back to us and they said, yeah, you were right up for it, which we obviously loved and hearing your opinions through the past couple months now has just been phenomenal and seeing you grow as well getting even more confident seeing how you've become advocates and you know really pushing your own thoughts and opinions about what can improve our local communities has been so inspiring to see as well because I don't know if I'd be able to do that when I was your age back then and I think you know it's just it's so phenomenal to see that growth <laughs> but yeah we wanted to really talk to change makers because all our peer researchers were young people ourselves. So the whole project is about raising up and leveling up youth voice and getting it known to stakeholders, people in power, different services. So the police, support services, children's services, even transport as well. It's like literally everything that impacts our day-to-day -day life is so important because it impacts young people's lives daily. But Definitely. yeah, I don't know if Dean wants to pick up from now. Yeah, I'd, I, I think um, to add on to that, I'd say as peer researchers, obviously you mentioned, Grace, we are young people ourselves, um, slightly older than our change makers who are here today. Um, but I think it's good that we can kind of, um, obviously we'll delve deeper into these issues um, today. Um, but I think what's been brilliant is, you know, thinking about our own experiences growing up in, in Merseyside and maybe comparing that, you know, what's similar, what's different. Um and yeah, I just think it's been brilliant that PAC has been such a, to me anyway, I think it's been a refreshing project. I think it's been um, entirely youth led. Um, and, you know, I, I like to think that we've kind of helped empower you as change makers a little bit. Um, but I think there's something that you mentioned there, Grace, about, um, you know, 
youth violence. There's so many other issues attached to it. And I know we're going to discuss um, them today. Um, so I think the first thing we wanted to talk about is kind of things being tackled at the root causes mm -hmm. and um, how youth violence is. It's not a one dimensional issue, even though some people do see it like that. Um, and yeah, so either of our change makers, I'm going to go over to you to talk maybe about um, why you feel like it's it's important to tackle things at the root cause and what you feel maybe some of those root causes are i think some of the root causes are mental health poverty and drugs mm -hmm. so we've got mental health poverty drugs and i know before you did mention a bit about mental health as well and how that can impact young people too um and we've got some other ones a little bit about hate crime as well anything you would like to share charlie um, that's, it's pretty much the same as like Maggie's said, apart from that, like with school and like stereotypes as well in school. Yeah. So maybe touching on on that issue of mental health, then what would you um, talk to me about that, about your your kinds of views on that, and um, you know maybe what your message would be to to professionals out there, and um, what you'd like to see change, maybe. Um, overall, like a message to like people in power about mental health is like. They need to stop being so closed off towards it because mm. like young people obviously need help and if we're not getting it while we're young we're probably not going to get it as we get older so like for me like i've had a somewhat positive experience with like white pass and being able to get support from them but like other places it's a lot harder to get support mm. what do you think of some of because like you say it's, it's sometimes hard for for young people to access support what do you think some of them barriers are from maybe your own experience or you know people young people that you've spoken to just being like scared to reach out in case of like being judged by people mm. or like if parents will be contacted about it and things so, kind so is there an element of fear would you say like yeah not only experiencing it but trying to get support it can be quite a stressful experience can't it definitely i think it links back to that um you know we've said it so many times but the stigma of mental health that still exists today um you know it's just not viewed the same as physical health for whatever reason um you know i say it all the time but if someone has a broken leg um you wouldn't expect them to be told to, to, you know, snap out of it or just, you know, change the mood or whatever, because, you know, it's a physical issue that people can, can see. And I think that's part of the problem um, with mental health is that it's something that, that can't be seen. You can't just put on a smile and pretend like everything's okay when it's not. Like, you definitely do need to talk about it and mm. have a safe space to do so and have a person that you can speak about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So alongside mental health and stigma and hate hate speech as well would you how would you say it's dealt with with different services from your perspective um some of them like deal with it really well well such as like why pass but then compared to like school they prefer you to be like closed-minded to it because like they don't want to look bad mm. by being um given all of these problems to solve so in terms of, um, you know, experiences with mental health or um, I feel like sometimes people have this preconception about mental health that it's always like, um, you know, we talk about people with mental health issues or, you know, if people are experiencing difficulties, but a lot of, we all have mental health um, and it's something that we all kind of experience to some degree. Um, and, you know, it's it's all to do with well-being, isn't it? Do you think that that's... Um, understood completely in education settings from your experience it's not fully understood they have like a little bit of understanding but in, but not enough okay. to be able to deal with it or to help with like a greater benefit what tools do you think schools could adopt to improve how they deal with mental health and young people in general to help support them um, to stop having favourites in school because like they say they don't have favourites but like it's quite clear to see that they do and to have like an open mind and like don't judge someone before they come to you asking for help yeah just let them speak and then choose like what to do yeah how do you think that makes young people feel when there is that favouritism it makes them feel like obviously like um 
they're not like welcome, but like it just makes them feel worse as a person because like they don't know why, like they don't deserve the same as everyone else. Mm. And do you think that be part of your message as well about maybe um, lifting young people up rather than, than making them feel that way yeah. or, you know, yeah. Uh, so Maggie, I'll, I'll come to you again. Um, are your experiences similar, different? Talk to me about that. So, um, I have a youth club that I go to and it's my safe place, but not a lot of people have a place to go. Mm. And my youth club has gave me millions of opportunities, opportunities that I wouldn't have if I didn't go there and it's something to do as well. Yeah, definitely. And I think in schools, teachers should be trained on different abilities so they understand more about like what's happening. Um, mm. So, so do you think maybe um, similar to what I was saying to Charlie? Do you think like schools and um, those kinds of education settings? Do you think could could learn a little bit from youth clubs and the safe spaces that you've talked about? Yeah, yeah. What's different from your youth club to school, or like the teachers compared to the youth workers in school? Sometimes. Um, I don't understand the work and the teacher shout at me. Okay, so we've been talking overall a bit about a lot of different systems, a lot of different services. And I don't know if there's anything else you would like to add to that. And maybe what I've already asked you a little bit about what sort of tools can schools try and implement, but is there anything a little bit more specific you might have thought of? Um, like maybe for some people having like a certain teacher they can speak to like open all the time to go and speak to to say you like you need to take time out of lessons to speak to them maybe having that like as an opportunity for people to use okay so what do you think makes a teacher or somebody a safe person to talk to so like for me in my school the school chaplain um that's the person i speak to just like someone like you see every day like a teacher who mm. you like you trust and you feel safe with like a teacher like that. That's I think that's wonderful that to hear. Yeah. Definitely. I think that trust is really important um, and vital. I'm just interested, Grace, um, you know, thinking about things that we're talking about today. What, something I'm really interested about is, um, you know, like Charlie, obviously, um, how, like, do you mind me asking how old you are? Um, I'm 15. So you're 15. So obviously me and Grace are a little bit older. Um, but you know we're kind of the same generation I suppose um, but I'm really interested in terms of like our education um, and like our experience of that and services I don't really feel in terms of like mental health and things like that I don't think we've we've moved on an awful lot from what I'm hearing from Charlie um, but I do agree with, with what you say Charlie and I think it's it's wonderful that you have like trusted adults that you can speak to because that is really important <clears throat> Yeah, and I think what as well you've mentioned before about different teachers having favourites and then how that can negatively impact the, you know, classroom dynamics. Yeah. I completely see that. I think definitely me and Dean, I think when we were mm. in education, we <laughs> saw that and it can lead you feeling quite uncomfortable as well. And that doesn't help as well with your own mental health. When I remember thinking, well, other people think I'm getting preferential treatment because a teacher thinks you know I'm favorite you know I'm a goody two shoes mm. and then you've got this new label attached to you which you didn't necessarily intend for and it, it can be a hard way to navigate can't it so yeah mm. having that understanding from teachers maybe to be a bit more mindful that, that could make a difference even if it's just a small amount mm, could be so impactful. I think that goes for him I mean obviously I, I, I don't know if this is how you feel Charlie but I think it goes for all kinds of professionals in all services and things like that is um you know the importance of that interaction with the young person because a lot of the time I think people have this thing of like passing the book almost along because you know the elephants in the room is that there is a lot of pressure on yeah. on youth services schools all these types of things um but I think you know it's something that really strikes me is that you know say teachers or you know in a school environment um it might be like a really difficult year for example or a, a difficult um time um, for them but for that young person um, you know for people like yourself Charlie you only go through school once yeah you only get that once so 
you know, every interaction counts. And that's what we've been saying throughout the project about professionals and things like that, the importance of interactions and just good communication um, with young people. Do, do, what talk, talk me through like your views on that and feel and listen to maybe. I agree with what you're saying. Just like, if like we've got like such a short amount of time and like we are really young, mm. just like by them having an open mind, like even, even just smiling at us or saying like good morning to us, that like, that like impacts us for like, a bet to have a better day because we know that like we're not being judged they're just trying to speak to us like we're normal people because like we are we're almost adults so being treated like one like helps yeah i think it it, it it links it all links back a little bit to to what we were talking about at the beginning about tackling things at the root causes i mean i said about the pressure on you know schools and yeah. services and things like that um and i think it all links back to, to needing systemic change it won't come overnight but but you know it is needed isn't it because so many people don't feel represented or um listened to um i don't know if, if do, do we want to move on and talk about something that yeah because charlie i know that there was other things that you wanted to talk about that do relate to the education system um and i want to see your perspective of other ways the school system might be able to improve to help support all students in their education but yeah oh, that sounds okay yeah that sounds yeah. okay yeah so i know that you wanted to mention a little bit about lgbt awareness and it doesn't just impact school and education but it impacts so many other things everything in your daily life and i wanted to hear your perspective on it from a young person who's going through it that's like i am a part of the community like school before i moved schools like schools wouldn't talk about it anything to do with it was like okay you can't mention it to us so like i people didn't really like me because i was in the community because they're very uneducated but since i've moved in like school schools have improved slightly um in my school i've had like trans teachers and teachers part of the community come in to teach us so we're getting like our education that we need, but we're also getting other education related relating to the community. Yeah, definitely. So obviously you've been, you've just said you've been in two very different school environments in terms of like LGBT awareness and inclusion. Um, what impact has that had on you personally to, you know, have those role models in, in terms of teachers to look up to uh, and, you know, just have more inclusion and, and, and celebration of, of that? Um, well, I think first of all, I should probably start with that, like, they're both Catholic schools that I've been to. Yeah. And, like, I guess, like, there's always the stereotype of religion being, like, they don't accept it. Yeah. So, like, for me, having the role models who, like, my school chaplain, who accept it, that's, like, better for me. Because I know that, like, I'm not being judged in a school where, um, like, I don't have a religion in there. Or, yeah. like, people aren't going to agree with me. It's just like overall better in my life because then I know that you know, I have a problem. So like it's a hate crime from someone. Mm. I know I can go and report it to them. So you don't feel like, you know, it's not a contentious issue or like something where you think, oh, I don't know if I can talk about that. It's something that you feel comfortable yeah. sharing in school. That's brilliant because I mean, I can only relate it back to my own experience. You know, I'm also a member of the LGBT community. Um, and, you know, like we were saying about differences in our education and like, um, you know, when I say education, I don't just mean like academic, it's, you know, the, the wider social yeah. issues, isn't it? Um, but I only left school in like 2019, so it wasn't that long ago. Um, but, we, you know, I, I know, I think you've mentioned that you had a, you've got an LGBT club. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we never had that at school. And um, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that like I had a really negative experience in school because that's not kind of reflective of my experience. Like I didn't really go through a lot of bullying and that sort of thing, but it's great to hear that like representation and things like that are getting better. Cause, um, you know, not to just dwell on my own experiences, but I do think it's relevant. Um, I, in, it was actually in 2019. So when I was in year 11, not that long ago, uh, and we kind of had like current affairs discussions, you know, um, within like a form group in school. Um, and it was around the time when LGBT education was being talked about a bit more uh, and it was, you know, being brought onto the curriculum. 
and obviously there were some protests around the country about that and people had kind of different thoughts on it. Um, and basically, um, I don't think the discussion was facilitated well in my experience as, you know, an LGBT person. Yeah. I think it made me feel quite uncomfortable and a bit like I had to defend myself. There was a few members of the class, I'd say, who made quite ignorant, ill-informed, uneducated comments. Um, things like, you know... Um, teaching people about, um, teaching young people, should I say, about um, gay relationships will make them become gay. And I was like, that's not the way it works. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, and I just feel like things like that should be called out and challenged. But it's great to hear that, you know, um, things have moved on a little bit. And for, for like my sister in that sense, like, I didn't think she knew anything about it because like, she's still quite young. Yeah. But to know that her school is making an improvement to like adjust everyone saying that it's okay to have like, different relationships and that like it's something to be spoken about that's like I'm quite happy with that mm. like I feel in inspired by that because like then I know I can speak to my sister when she's older about things like that mm. so obviously we're f right now we're focusing on like the LGBT side of things and um you know people feeling comfortable in, in that environment and um, but even like more generally in terms of youth violence and like the issues we're discussing today do you think it's important to have um that awareness and um kind of I don't know um setting like a, a positive attitude about these things from an earlier age to um, you know yeah change things from from you know that early age do you think that's important I think it's like that's like the main thing that's like really important because it all starts with like racism for example mm. and like being horrible to someone it starts from like when you grow up so yeah. being taught things like that things like the um lgbt community that's like gonna help them to understand that it is okay and to like help like with the rights a hundred percent because nobody comes onto this world world hateful or mm -hmm. disrespectful of other yeah. people it is learned behavior it's something that they've seen they've heard whether it's family friends those in the community yeah, on how they act and that's how you formulate a lot of your opinions however you do spend a lot of time in school and the education system where you can be taught about other people and their different lifestyles and you know learn that new perspective where the people that you might be immediately around they might not know they might be extremely mm. ill-informed and bigoted and you know what in a place of education it's, it's your time to learn about other people different cultures different religions but why don't we talk about different sexual orientations different gender identities because that's important of course because you see that in your day-to-day -day life mm -hmm. and the fact that is sort of treated a bit like a taboo in some cases some schools and they're not quite getting it right it definitely needs to be looked at and reanalyze because 100%. it's so important they need to move on with the times we're not in an archaic system anymore definitely. you know everyone's different charlie i'm just interested um obviously you mentioned um you know as a, as a member of the lgbt plus community yourself you um you feel comfortable in your school um we haven't obviously this conversation is about safe spaces and things like that and um also hate crime um how do you feel like in terms of levels of safety, how do you feel outside of education? Um, like I'm okay with like some places outside of education. Just like I feel like I have to do my own research to make sure that it's going to be okay. That yeah. like people there are okay. with like if I come, say if I'm going there for pride and I have like um, makeup on that mm. signifies I'm in like the LGBT community. Yeah. I, I feel like I have to do my own research, be like, okay, I can go there. That's interesting about, you know, having to do, you know, I mean, I've felt that as well. Um, do you think too often the the kinds of response, and the, and this goes not just for the LGBT plus community, but, you know, all kinds of, um, you know, people who may experience um, violence or, you know, that kind of thing. Do you think too often the, the kinds of responsibility is placed on the victim or the potential victims of these crimes? Um, yeah, most of the time it is because like, they're like, it's kind of like the elephant in the room. It's yeah. like, it's about them. So like people think it's going to be their fault when actually like it's not their fault. 
So, yeah, so it links to vic- victim blaming, doesn't it? Um, what do you think could be done to to reassure more people, you know, like you and me, or, you know, just, it doesn't have to relate to LGBT, but more people who may feel scared on the streets. Um, what do you think can be can be done? Obviously, we mentioned safe spaces. Do you think there needs to be more promotion of that? Like, what? talk me through that. Um, in the sense of, like, there being more promotion, like, there needs to be more promotion, but not loads, like, it's on the news, because otherwise, like, people who know that it's a safe place might come in and, like, try and stop that from happening. Mm-hmm. But maybe things like in hospitals, they say that if you swear at them, if you shout at them, you're going to get, like, kicked out. I think, like, more things like that, so people are aware, like, it's not going to be tolerated. Yeah. Definitely having a zero tolerance policy and mindset as well. Because mm. I think that bystander effect kicks in where people are just like, somebody else will say something, but everyone feels like, you know what, this isn't right. Yeah. Or nobody actually wants to stand up and say, you know what, that's wrong. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know about you, Grace, mm-hmm. as obviously a woman. Um, I'm sure you, I'm sure you've had, you know, similar experiences, but I can only speak for me as from an LGBT point of view. Uh, I've definitely, I can definitely identify what you're saying, Charlie, even as an older pair, like an older person, sound like I'm like really old there. Um, but even as an, uh, an older young person, can I say, um, I've experienced that and like, Obviously, this is something that you you haven't got experience of, but nightlife and things like that is a huge thing. Um, you know, in terms of my fr- a lot of my friends obviously don't come from the LGBT community. I'm friends with a lot of um, straight girls, um, and they'll often say like, "Oh, do you want to come to to this place or whatever?" And still now, like even though I feel accepted on the whole in my day to day life and and everything like that. I'll still kind of think, oh, should I go there? Or what if something bad happens? Um, and it's like what you said about like wearing makeup or expressing that kind of thing. Like, I, um, you know, I've bought makeup and stuff in the past, but people always say to me, oh, would you wear makeup like on a, on a day-to-day basis? Or, and it's like, I really wouldn't feel comfortable like getting public transport, um, going to certain places, certain environments. I think it's, I don't know whether this is, is what you experienced, Charlie, but it's, just the safe spaces are fine, but it's getting there and it's like, it's commuting around that, isn't it? And, and knowing yeah. how to like, how to navigate that and, and actually be yourself in the process. <laughs> Is that something that you've, you've yeah. kind of experienced I know that well? like on public transport with like people who go to my school, like I often feel like I need to avoid them because I'm scared of like what might happen. And then there'll be like other people who see it, but won't do nothing. Mm. Definitely. Grace, just just briefly, obviously I said about your own experiences. It's something that came up so much in our research with loads of young people, um, of young women and um, violence against women and girls. And I feel like we should address that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, Definitely. A huge theme was fear of the unknown. Yeah. And who who can you trust? Who Who's going to have your back, especially if you're commuting to different places by yourself? So things like having street lights on and, you know, like, oh, what am I wearing? Because a lot of the time there is that fix and blaming, whether it's from the media, people you know, people that might be from any community that you're in. You feel like there's going to be a lot of judgment. And if you don't do everything that you can do to prevent an incident from happening to you, like you had no hand to play in it yeah. whatsoever that you've got to take all these precautions just so you can almost defend yourself and say you yeah. know what well I did this 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 and something still happens I don't really think people should be living in fear the what what if something happens will I get the blame will you know will I be safe you know using public transport public transport for everyone it's in the name we should feel safe going to and from different places but why isn't that? Do we want more CCTV or should we actually be giving maybe harsher punishments yeah. to those who do decide to, uh, decide to, you know, cross that line and be hateful, be, um, threatening, threatening. Exactly. In a lot of instances, and yeah. so many times people will say, Oh, I'm not going to report that. I don't know how to, I don't know who I can go to will I be believed mm. that's a huge one because there is that fix and blaming again well that, that's so the, tough that's the crucial question isn't it and something I, I'm I, I want to know from you Charlie um about kinds of reporting and things like that and you know in that instance um do you feel that you know 
we were talking about this earlier, weren't we, about yeah. hate crime and, you know, what you've just said, Grace, mm. being believed uh, is a big thing. Would you feel comfortable re- reporting an instance of hate crime or, you know, what would you feel would happen going forward from that? I think in the moment I'd be like, oh, yeah, come report it. But later on, if I go to report it, I'd be like, get more anxious so I feel more scared because I know that, like, other, the pers- other person who's been involved they're gonna, they might like get other people saying like, oh no, this was not happened. So then ultimately you feel like you're not going to get believed. Yeah. So just to kind of, I know we've touched on a few things already, but just to hear it from you directly, um, what do you think needs to change in that culture about, um, you know, various things, victim blaming. Mm-hmm. Um, head mindset Responsibility, well. yeah, yeah, head mindset. But what do you think needs to change in order for people to think, yeah, I, I am going to report this issue and I will be trusted and believed. It's like a really hard thing to say, like, like what should change? Because I know that, like, if it's dark outside and I see someone who looks, like, a bit suspicious on the other side of the road, I will, like, force myself to walk to the other side because like, I don't know what's going to happen. So, like, I think it's more about, like, we need more, like, police officers who are, like, who can deal with it are not only based on like that one topic so like to like like say you have a number to call if like you you're scared to like walk on your own or like something's happening and like you need an escape from someone yeah definitely Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 100% okay so the way you've mentioned about having a number to call a safe person to contact and you know what for some people when a serious incident does happen or even something that you might be pondering, oh, is this is this serious enough to contact the police? Do you feel like many people will go to the police with these issues and do they think they'll deal with them in the right way? I don't think many people will go to the police just because like what we see on the media, but how like something's happened and then the, the victim will get the blame and like the other person gets let off. Like many people wouldn't go for that reason. And I think part of it is like blame on like people in power, like the police and people, because like they need enough evidence to build a case about case against people, but like they need like physical evidence of it. It's not like they try and get like the evidence from people who you can see have like quite clearly been through it and are struggling. Yeah, and definitely that's hard to prove something's happening because mm-hmm. I think when you are a victim at the time you're not thinking oh okay I need to collect evidence I need to make sure that you know I might have an eyewitness here you're not thinking it's about not the that process, you're, is it? No. you're trying it's to think not. oh gosh how do, how do I escape how do I leave mm. this situation that's making me feel extremely uncomfortable where you know I might be attacked I might be feeling threatened that's so so hard mm. to then go through that mind process of wait I need some evidence here yeah. let's think a little strategically no one's gonna think like that naturally so there's so much injustice that happens, but it's, you get left in a rock and a hard mm. place because you understand, yeah, there needs to be evidence. But it, at the same time, this did happen. It's yeah. like with the same, like, boys will be boys or, like, not all men. Like, we know it's not all men. It's just, like, but it, it's but, a majority of them at this point. For the men that it is, we need to tackle that issue. And the issue mm. is not women in yeah. that instance. Like, it shouldn't be, like, boys will be boys. It's like, if someone likes you, they're not going to go out of their way to hurt you. Mm. I love that you've said that about the phrase boys will be boys because I've always took issue with it it's kind of like it's just like ah, oh, well they're going to do it anyway and it's like no it's it's kind of an acceptance of like not changing culture and that's what we need to do isn't it um, just while we're on the topic of the police and I know that um, mistrust of authority was like a huge issue um, in our research especially being in Merseyside you know some of like the local context um and things like that there's historic reasons why people might be fearful or um not trusting um what what do you th- obviously um we've spoke a little bit about community um police uh, and maybe like increasing that increasing the, the level of supporting communities um do you think that would be better in terms of the police not coming across as like intimidating or what do you think about that? I think that's like a good point about like how they do look quite intimidating. And so like they often will try and make you think that way. And like, even if they're not, they try and be nice. It's just like you hear so much about them, that them like not being nice people. It's like 
we need to reduce the stigma around that and like let them even if we hold like conferences with the police mm. to try and build like young people's connections like better definitely you know what i think thinking back we did have community engagement officers come into one of our change maker sessions how did you find that did that change any of your perceptions or you know what was the overall experience for you when like i first heard that they was coming i was like okay i'm not really gonna speak to them because like <laughs> i don't like the police because like things have happened before but like once they came in like we started talking and like they were eager to like try and change some of the things in merseyside it's like i had i started to think change my opinion something like some of them will try and help you. It's just about building like a connection with them and getting them to understand like your issues. So do you, do you think that's key to maybe this, if we're talking about solutions, because obviously, you know, we speak a lot about the problems of youth fans because they do exist. But yeah. I think it's important, especially like for young people, that we have to be solution focused. We always have to be like focused on on the end results and basically what, what we're asking for. Um, but talking about solutions do you think um that would help kind of build up the relationship between the police young people if you know they came into more youth spaces like that uh, and you know there was a bit more of an bit more integrated thinking maybe the police kind of understood young people more young people un understand the police i think that might have like a major effect on people because like it doesn't matter like where they can come into if they come into school it's about having like a safe space with like no teachers or anything just to share your opinions like without feeling judged definitely thinking a little bit then about your main messages if you were to write like a list of i don't want to say demands but yeah i'm going to say i'm going to go for it uh, if you were to write a list of demands to professionals and um, people in in positions of power basically in merseyside and nationally as well what would you what would you want to tell them um First of all, like my overall message before about having like open minds towards young people was like, we do care about certain topics. We're just not given the opportunity to care. Mm. Um, that's like one of my main ones. Um, another message would be like, um, build like a better connection in school for young people. Like, again, open minds for everyone. Mm -hmm. And like with hate crimes, like make sure people know how to report it like what a hate crime is definitely mm -hmm. uh, but it, it is definitely given that inf information and informing young people about the processes of what they can do and how they can get that help get that support because the thing is if you don't recognize it you might brush it off as well because mm -hmm. i know that happens so often because there's that normalization so that's yeah. a really key point that you just mentioned there and i think like you've yeah. just said grace that i've sometimes I think people might be and I, and I know this through like um something we haven't discussed but um neurodiversity and we've had a lot more awareness of that in recent years as well um you know catering to to everyone's needs and having equity not always equality because people have obviously different needs um but yeah I think that's great about like having people made aware of the processes before they have to go through that yeah. process and because sometimes people might be like oh i'm scared to to do this because i don't know you know what's going to happen or you know um what i'm going to have to go through to access a certain service i think the media needs to have like more of an understanding instead of like for example the death of brianna um jai yeah. where she was like brutally killed just with being like trans like they need to not focus on the fact that she was trans and focus on the fact that like she didn't do anything wrong and that mm. we need more support for people who are run vulnerable definitely um well i think it's been brilliant to hear um your views and obviously as as one of our change makers uh, it's been brilliant to see like how you've um you've played such a key role in pack as of all the change makers and we're so grateful for that aren't we grace yeah um, but I think obviously, like we said about being solution focused, we have to look to the future. Um, you're a young person. If we're thinking about hopes for the future and even, you know, long term, we're talking five, 10 years. Um, what are your hopes like personally and for, for other young people in Merseyside? Um, one of my hopes is that like, although we can never get rid of any like issues like youth violence fully, is that like we have better understandings of like what these issues are. And that not only do we give support to the victims, 
but we give support to the people who are like um maybe harming other people because of it because like oh it, it is their fault partly but like we don't know what's going on in their life so like they need support and then like another long-term solution or like hope that i have is that like um is that like everyone is given like equal rights in the mm. sense of like what they need so for example like um if you've got like mental health problems like having rights for that instead of just being like brushing everything off brilliant thank you charlie um so that brings us to the end of today's episode so thank you everyone for tuning in uh, I, i'm sure you'll agree it's been great hearing um charlie's thoughts um as a change maker your kind of journey <laughs> on the project and some of your views and um demands for professionals in Merseyside and some of your hopes for the future as well because I think it's important always to to look to the future have you got anything to add Grace? Yeah 100% and I think Charlie's like proof and as well as us as well that young people can give loads of valuable information and insight to problems and issues that need to change and also say things that are being done well so having more young people involved in that co conversation and a bit of co-production happening could be so so mm. so impactful and i hope that some people take that away with them definitely i'd, I'd final thoughts i'd just say don't be afraid to speak up because your voice has power and value even so, if like people aren't speaking up for themselves like other people it's gonna greatly like impact everyone else around them definitely uh, so on that note on a very hopeful note i'll say uh, thank you everyone for tuning in and um Catch the next KidCast episode.